you so much for visiting our channel. We are IFGF Los Angeles, and we are one church that meets in four campuses across Los Angeles. If you want more information on how to attend one of our services or how to get connected with our church, please visit ifgfla.com. This message was recently filmed in our Monrovia campus and features our senior pastor, Daniel Hanafi. We hope you are blessed. How are you doing, folks, in West L.A., in Chino, in uh, Orange County, and all over Monrovia, this area of the, in your neck of the woods here? Well, as you finish your giving and um, preparing your hearts for giving, and um, praise God for the giving uh, platform online, isn't it? We can, all, uh, we can, we can do church in, uh, in this manner. Stuff has gone worse since last week, hasn't it? Wow, You're my first, our, for most of us, our first week of uh, just being um, quarantined and just staying at home as much as we can. Um, we have a, a, a shelter in place order now in place right here in uh, California as well as, as well as Los Angeles. And um, all the non-essential businesses have closed. USA now has 20, more than 24,000. 24,000 confirmed cases, placing us the third after China and Italy in the number of cases. This is serious matter, folks. This is no, no joke anymore. I mean, praise God, the death rate is still in the 300s, uh, which is way lower than Ch either China or Italy. But the number of cases is right there, 24,000 plus and rising quickly. As a matter of fact, the, our, our graph, our curve, it's just exactly superimposed on, on the Italy's curve. It's just exactly the same. We're just 11 days behind. Wow, we cannot continue this, this course. Otherwise, we will overwhelm our uh, medical uh, establishments. And um, this morning, as I drop off my wife to work, uh, she's working right now, Sunday, 6 o'clock in the morning. She's a clinical lab scientist. And... Um, there is no off for, for medical personnel. Cannot take even a day off now. Hospitals are filled up. They opened up two new wings in that, uh, in that hospital where my wife worked for 36 years now. Um, they, uh, this, this building that they're not using anymore, they opened up two new wings just to, to, to take in all the corona cases. And it's a, it's a difficult time. It's a challenging time. It's a real real challenge, and we cannot just take it lightly. We are in this thing together. Now, first, we must do what wisdom tells us to do, which is Proverbs 27, verse 12. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. Isn't that interesting, the word hide himself, like quarantine, self-isolation? A wise man, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. The simple pass on and are punished, either punished by the disease itself or I, I just heard today that um, the, uh, all, all, the police, uh, all the policemen in, the, in our county here in, in Los Angeles are now working 12-hour shifts because they have to enforce this stay-at-home order. Well, <clears throat> we need to obey the government that God sets above us. We need to self-isolate. And um, that's how we're going to kill this virus because this virus is going to die if we don't transmit it. So let's stop all our participation in public gatherings and stop this virus in its tracks. Uh, somebody posted this and, and I, it's just pretty amazing that uh, quarantine is in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 20. Go home, my people, and lock your doors. Hide yourselves for a little while until the Lord's anger has passed. Interesting, isn't it? Um, the Bible just contains everything, right? But it's, a, it's something that is wise to do for right now. Having said all that, though, I want to uh, prepare all of us here for what's ahead of us. This is a serious matter, but this is also a time for battle. It's not a time to, to just... Uh, 
sunk, sink into inactivity and just slouch on the couch and go into a Netflix binge. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, to fight this thing. Now, the first thing that you do is obey the, the government, obey that order, and avoid uh, uh, social contact, social distancing. you got to do that. This is how we kill the virus. But as the children of God, as the people of God, what else are we supposed to do? Listen, this is, I want to call all of you to arms in the prayer, prayer realm right here. This is how we're going to fight. We have to understand how we all must pray. Listen, this is a time to pray. Nobody can give an excuse anymore you don't, that you don't have time. You have time. Let's use it to fight. And we fight it on our knees. Amen. We're going to fight this thing on our knees. We're going to pray that the Lord will use this, these times. God, never waste a tragedy. Never waste a, a problem. We're going to use it. What the devil meant for bad, we, the Lord meant it for good. And we, the people of God, we better be on top of it. Amen. We better be on top of it. We better be the ones that understand the vision. Like, let's be like the Issacharites. Those few people that understands, that sees what, what is going on, that understand the time of the Lord, understand what Israel ought to do. Let's be the ones that, are, that, are, that have the vision of what needs to be done. Let's prepare the body of Christ for a great harvest. This is the time of warfare. It's not the time for relaxation. Let's, listen, we, I want to talk about prayer today. Disciples and their prayers. I want to talk about how we are supposed to be acting during this time. This is our weapon in this fight. How do you pray? Can we pray with certainty? For instance, that God will spare us from this plague. Now before I get into this, let me call your attention to two words. Talk about this in my broadcast last Thursday. But let me, let me say this to you. There are two words that you need to understand in the Bible. Those two words are from and through. From and through. Here's what I mean by this. God can protect you from trials. Or he can protect you when you go through trials. Right? But there are two words that are different. Both are in scriptures. Let me read to you the first one, the one that I like, okay? Rev Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. It says, since you have kept my command and endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Isn't that what we're going through right now? The test on the whole inhabitants of the earth. That's what's going on. But here's a promise here that, that, that I, I, yeah, this is good. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to touch the inhabitants of the earth. Of course, this is talking about the end times. But listen, there is this word that God sometimes would keep his people from the trials that befalls the world. It's there. I like this. How about you? Do you like this? Do you want to be kept from this trial? Amen. Me too. Hallelujah. But then, of course, there's the other verse in Isaiah 43. It's good too. Don't get me wrong. It says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. Amen. Are you redeemed? Are you redeemed, Chino? Are you redeemed, OC? Are you redeemed, West LA, Monrovia? Come on. Are you redeemed? Yeah. Huh? We are redeemed. Amen. And it says here, I have summoned you by name. Does the Lord know you by name? Thank God he knows me by name. And then he says, you are mine. Are you his? Are you his? Are you sure you belong to the Lord? Does the Lord have all the rights to your life, your future, your dreams, your aspiration, your, your every wants and needs? Are you his? I, 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 the greatest thing I can say in my life is that I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. 
How many of you can say that with all your heart? I belong to Jesus. Amen. My whole life, my future, my welfare, my dreams, my hopes, I belong to Jesus. Praise God. This is for you then. It says, when, verse 2, Isaiah 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Well, at this point, I'm, I'm glad, but I'm also like, how about no waters? <laughs> I, I prefer not getting into the waters, you know, like, can we go back to Revelation 3.10 here? But it says when, it's not even if, when you pass through the waters. Look, folks, I could not so joyful <laughs> news for you. It's a matter of time. You're going to go through waters. Maybe if you have been a Christian for a while, you already know this. It's only a matter of time. It's going to happen. You're going to go through trials. Things are going to go south. Stuff's going to get, get diff difficult. Things outside your control will not be nice to you. Well, if you've been living a long time, you know that that already happened quite a number of times. Amen. But there is a good comfort here. Do not fear. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers... They will not sweep over you. Thank God. We were not going to be swept and drowned. No. We might get wet. We might get cold in that river. We might get nervous in that river. But God says, you will not be swept. You're not, be over, you know, you, you're not going to be over flooded. You're not going to be drowned. It's not going to happen. It says, when you walk through the fire. Three times the word through right here. Through the waters, through the floods, and through the fire. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Thank God. Amen. Come on, be grateful for these promises. Amen? Amen. Now, both are good promises. But yeah, of course, if I had a choice, I prefer the first one. Keep me from trials. The question is this. Can I pray for that? Can I pray for that? Can I pray like, God, I don't want to go through trials. The answer is, why not? Why not? Of course you can. But if God chooses the second scenario, let's accept it with faith. Amen. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Either way, God promises his presence and protection no matter what we have to go through. But it's not wrong to ask for the first. I don't think so. Or do you think we should just ask, Lord, whatever is your will, you know, I, I, I don't even want to bother to try to discern your will, but whatever is your will, if you want me to be healthy, great. If you want me to get sick, fine. If you want me to die, it's okay. After all, you know, it's better uh, to, be with, uh, uh, to be with Christ. It's, it's better. Well, listen, I don't think that's what God expects you. That's called a lazy faith. Lazy faith. You don't, even, you don't even want to put your faith in action right there. You're just like, okay, whatever. And you mask it and you hide behind God is sovereign. Of course God is sovereign. Of course God is sovereign. But doesn't, doesn't the Lord want his children to start knowing his will? Doesn't his, he want his children to start to grow up? And start becoming his partners. Not that he needs a partner. But because he wants to share his glory with us. He wants to share this joy with us. Because one day he says he's, he wants us to rule and reign with him. It's a journey there. It's a journey. And this is the journey of faith. Amen. So how should be our attitude in prayer? In this whole crisis. How should we pray? Okay, I have three things for you. The first thing. Know his purpose. You have to know his purpose. You have to know his will. First John chapter 5, verse 14 in the New Living Translation. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. Anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. You can be confident he will give you what you ask for. If you know 
that what you ask pleases him. The question is, do you know his will? Do you know what pleases him? In other words, you cannot just put your faith and ask for something that is not in his will. It's not going to get answered. It's not going to come to pass. You must understand that God will only do his will. So it's our job to know his will. Right? So the first thing that we, meet, we must understand, got to know his purpose. Verse 18, we know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. The evil one cannot touch touch them. I like that because I really at this moment, even though I want to hug everybody, you know, I, I miss hugging so much and all that, but I'm glad he says the evil one cannot touch me. I am claiming for your, for your health also that coronavirus, COVID-19 will not touch you. The evil one, that thing is evil. It's not going to touch you. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. But here it is. You have to know God's will because, here's the next thing I want to say to you, prayer is not about getting my will done in heaven. It's getting God's will done on earth. Is that true? Huh? Prayer is not about knocking on the doors of heaven until, you know, you bust it down and, 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 and uh, twist the arm of God. Be, with, the, with, the, with the relentless prayer that you can, that you, you, you can, I'm not going to stop praying until you hear me. You know, not with that kind of attitude. It's not about getting my will done in heaven. But it's about getting God's will done on earth. That means I am the one that needs to know God's will so that I can agree with him concerning thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Now... I do not see in Scripture that God is the author of sickness. He is the author of life. He says, I come so that they can have life and have it more abundantly. That's him. He is about life. He is about life abundant. Okay? Not about 60% decrease in lung capacity. That's not life abundant. That's coronavirus. It's not about abundance. Listen, folks. I do not believe that God is the author of death either. The Bible says that death is the last enemy that he will defeat. Okay, everybody still die today, these days. All of us dies. But it's still an enemy. It doesn't change of the, 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 the fact that it's an enemy. That is why when there is somebody sick, I don't care how close to death that person is or whatever it is. I am still going to pray for healing because the owner of life is God, not Satan, not sickness. Life comes from God. And if God is going to allow that person to pass, in, to pass into death and into his eternal presence, that's his business. I my business is to agree with him that he's all about life and life abundant. Amen. So, I believe that. I, that's his purpose. So, back to this learning about getting God's will done on earth. When you pray, if the request, if your request is wrong, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says slow. If you are wrong, God says grow. But if the request is right, the timing is right, and you are right, God says go. Amen. So that's a journey that we all have to go on. Look, we don't all suddenly become mature and know everything that God wants. But, hey, we are walking in faith here. The just shall live by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. It's okay. Sometimes he will say no. He's not angry. He just says no if, if you ask wrong. Anyhow, if I pray for somebody to get healed, I don't think I'm in the wrong. All right? Whatever his decision will be, it's up to him. But I will pray as much as I can, as much as I can understand 
God's purpose. And that I will find in the Bible. Therefore, this time, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Find out the promises of God. Start building a life based on the word of God. And start walking in the word of God. Believing the word of God. And when reality does not match up with the word of God, that's when faith comes to play. That's the tension between what you know is the will of God and what the reality is. It's like the thermostat and the thermometer. The thermometer is not wrong when it says whatever it says. Let's say in the summer, thermometer says it's 100. It may, yeah, it may be 100. But 100 is not the will of God for you, right? Because your body temperature is supposed to be 98, 99, right? So 100 degrees is not the will of God for you. Definitely not for me. That's too hot for me. The will of God for me is 72, all right? So I put my thermostat at 72, right? Even though the thermometer says, are you kidding me? This is 100, dude. I don't care if it's 100, but the will of me is 72. That's my thermostat, and my thermostat is relentless. It's not going to stop sending this command to my air conditioning until it actually becomes 72. Then it will rest. That's how my prayer has to work. You have to understand the difference between fact and truth. Do you know the difference? Between fact and truth. Fact and truth are two different things. Fact is reality. Truth is God's words. You need to understand the difference because, because sometimes these two don't agree. Like the fact is the doctor might tell, might tell you, you have three months to live. The truth is nobody has a, God, a hold on your life except God. Nobody can tell you how long you're going to live, Right? And the truth is, by his stripes you are healed. I don't care whatever people say about that verse that's about salvation and all that. No. Isaiah 53 verse 5 is about salvation and healing. And healing. Not just salvation. If you think that the Isaiah doesn't know the difference between the word healing and salvation, you're wrong. It is about healing. It is about salvation. Salvation of the soul, healing of the body. Why do you think Jesus had to suffer? If he just need to redeem us from our sins, he just had to die. Doesn't have to die a painful death. He could have just be, been beheaded. Done. He gave his life. All sins are forgiven. Then we are safe. Why was he beaten up? Why was he nailed? Why was he suffering pain? Because he wants not only to take the penalties of your sin, but he wants to take the suffering of your sickness. That's why he took it upon himself. That's why he said, by his stripes, you are healed. Amen. If you don't believe in healing, too bad for you. It's in the Bible. It's really too bad for you. But you go ahead, whatever you like. But the Bible does provide healing for those that believe. It is there. Amen. Number two. Know your place. Know his purpose. But you must know your place. What is your place? <laughs> I love, you know, I didn't discuss this with the music team. This is amazing, right? It's amazing. But the song that they sang today. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. That's right. Do you know that you're a child of God? Do you know that that's your place? Do you know that that makes you different? 1 John 5, 19. We know we are the children of God. 1 John 5 is talking about prayer and how your prayers get answered. How healing happens. And it says here... We know we are the children of God. Do you know if you are a child of God? Is that your place? Talking about place. You know. Are we different than the rest of the world? Does God make a difference between us and the world? Does God differentiate us from the rest of the world? Well, let's read this word. Talking about place here. Know your place. Exodus 8 verse 22. Exodus 8 is 
talking about the ten plagues, you know. Ten plagues that Moses was trying to get the people out of Egypt and Pharaoh is hardening his heart. No, you're not going to go. You're not going to go worship your God and this and that. And then the plagues come. The, the, the river turns to blood. And then the frogs, you know, come. And then, of course, the second plague, the frogs. And then uh, the magicians also produce more frogs and the whole thing. But this is the fourth plague. God is starting to make another point here. At first, it was just between Moses and Pharaoh and the magicians. But starting in the fourth plague, God is saying, I'll show you that I'm God because I'm going to make a difference between my people and your people. And this is what it says. But on that day, this is God talking through Moses, talking to Pharaoh. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? This sign will occur tomorrow. At the end of the day, folks, this is a spiritual warfare. The biggest warfare is not about COVID-19. It's about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Principalities in the air fighting it out. And God is saying, hey, this is, this is, this is, this is coming into, into action now. I'm going to put a sign. I'm going to show you that I'm here in this land. How many of you believe that God is still in the United States of America? God is still here, and God still loves this country. This country that has sent more missionaries into the world, more than any other countries in the world. This country that has been exporting righteousness and goodness to the world. I remember that growing up in, in, in Indonesia when I was a little child, listening to Voice of America, listening to the broadcast. We look up to this country. This is God's country. United States of America has not been forgotten by God. And he's going to show that he's still in here. He's going to show it by making a difference between his people and the other people. That's what's going to happen, folks. You live in Goshen. A place that God has set aside for you. Where the plagues not, you are not going to suffer the same plague as other people. God is going to make a difference, differentiate between you and other people. Do you believe it? Where do you live? Do you live in Goshen? Do you want to live in Goshen? Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. I think he's talking about Goshen, that secret place of the Most High. He hides under the shadow of the Almighty. Oh, where are you living? Where do you live? Where do you live? Are you living in the shelter of his grace? Or are you out there doing things on your own? And only once a week on Sunday, you're visiting Goshen. Now, you can't meet here. God is bringing your faith to a point of decision. Where do you want to live? You cannot live one foot in, the, in Goshen, one foot in Philistine, one foot with Jesus, one foot with the fleshly desires. Listen, folks, God put his people in his place. He that dwelt in the secret place of the Most High. They are the ones that are delivered from the deadly pestilence. This is what it's talking about. Know your place. That's plague number four. Then plague number seven, hail. 
verse 25, Exodus 9, verse 25. Throughout Egypt, hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. The only place it did not hail was the land of Goshen where the Israelites were. There is such a place. It's a place of refuge. It's a place of protection. Where is your place? Do you know your place? You know, the first two plagues, blood, red water, pollution, and frogs, you know, they affected only the Egyptians at first. But then the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, did the same thing to bother the Jews. So, yeah, the Jews got the frogs too, you know. The text does not say this explicitly, but only if the magicians added more frogs to bother the Jewish slaves would the Egyptians know that Egyptian magic was able to accomplish what it did, right? So in the third event, which is the gnats or the lice, the Egyptian ma magicians failed to do the same thing to the Jews. They started losing their power starting the plague number three and num plague number four. I just told you about it. That's when the Lord shows the difference between his people and Pharaoh's people. And then the seventh, and God make the, the place where they live, Goshen, off limits. Now the eighth event, the locust, it's a severe plague. And uh, it doesn't mention whether Goshen was off limits or not. But it does say that, uh, it does say this in Exodus 9 verse 20, 20 and 21. Uh, those officials of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and livestock inside. But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. So in other words, those that suffered that plague was those that are left outside in the field. Those that hide inside were spared. Now, why do they go inside and to be spared? It's because they fear the word of the Lord. So, assuming that the people of God in Goshen also feared the word of the Lord, they would have been spared also. They would have been spared also. So, know your place. Now, I'm not saying that nothing can touch you. Well, sometimes things can touch you, but God will be with you and God will deliver you. However, here's a clear passage in Scripture where you can say, Hey, I am God's people. There should be a difference. Is there a difference between me and people that do not know the Lord? Is there a difference between me that worship the Lord and those that curse the Lord? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. I don't want to, you to be ashamed to claim your place as a child of God. Yes, you are a child of God. Of course, it doesn't mean that he will spoil you and make you weak by just sheltering you from everything. Sometimes he, exposes, he allows you to be exposed to some things, but it's always to make you strong. It's always to bring you closer to him. It's always for the good of you. Nothing can harm you because you're the child of God. Amen. I want you to know your place. And lastly, got to know your posture. Be, by, based on this, we have to know his will. We have to know our place. Listen. Some people are so afraid of asking God that something because they're afraid they're going to ask wrong or whatever. You know, God loves you. You are his child. I when I was five years old, I remember I was serious. I was not even joking. My parents asked me what I want for my birthday. And I, very, I was very serious. I said, I want an elephant. Yeah, just like that. Straight face. I want an elephant. I was looking at our backyard. I already determined that, yeah, we, we, we do have space for an elephant. And, yeah, I don't see why not. My father and my mother, I believe they can do anything, okay, in my five-year-old mind. I said, sure they can do this. Why not? So I asked for an elephant. Now, of course, I did not get an elephant. I get a bicycle. It was an orange-colored bicycle, by the way, all oh, wrong color. But, but my point is, my parents didn't get mad. Why would they get mad? Here's a child sincerely asking. Okay, I'm not mature yet, not knowing what I was supposed to be asking for. But he's not angry. So know your place. 
Know your place. Knowing his purpose is a journey anyway. It's okay. Because this is the posture you should have. James 1.6 But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea. Blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Oh, but pastor, that, that passage is talking about asking for wisdom. What a, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not only you that understands the Bible, you know. But this is also talking about prayers and how to pray. Because it says that person should not expect to receive anything. Anything means all kinds of things, not just wisdom. All kinds of things you're asking from the Lord. You cannot expect to get anything if you are asking with doubt. Have a posture of trust. Have a posture of faith. Have a posture like, in the name of Jesus, I'm living in Goshen. My family is in Goshen. I am exempt from all that stuff. God is going to show the unbelievers who we are, who He is by making a difference. There is a difference between me that loves God and worships God. Amen. Are you different, brother? Are you different? Are you the child of God? Yes. Hallelujah. This guy, I don't see him every week because he's from OC. And uh, man, you are the child of God. There's a difference. God is going to treat us different. Know your posture. So that's how we ask. That's how we ask. Hebrews 11.6 And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Let's just be earnest. That's not too hard, right? Let's be earnest. Let's pray. Let's pray for our family to be exempt from this corona stuff. It's not a good thing. Yeah. And not only that, it's time for you to go into your phone book because you now have time instead of going to binging Netflix go into your, your phone book and find all those people that have been laying dormant there for a long time they haven't shown up at church you haven't talked to them for a long time call them and not only that here's what I want to challenge the whole IFGF Chino, OC, Monrovia, West LA here's what my challenge to you Pray for people. They need prayer right now. This is a good time to call your unbeliever friend and ask, hey, how are you doing? Do you need toilet paper? My church is, my church is uh, giving away toilet paper. We care for people. We want you to wipe properly. No, just kidding. No, just stop there. But call them and say, I care for you. I'm thinking about you. Can I pray for you? Can I pray for you? Let's be light in this darkness. Let's be the light in this darkness. James 5.13 Is anyone among you in trouble? Oh, a lot of people are in trouble today. Let them pray. See? Let's pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them. Online, of course. And anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. We'll show them the oil. <laughs> and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And the Lord will raise them up. Amen. But it doesn't stop there. It says, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Listen, this is the time for you to pray for people, to pray for healing, to pray for wellness, to pray for protection, and to pray for forgiveness of sins. Yeah. This is the time. God allowed this thing to happen because out of darkness, He will bring forth His light. And the Light is in you. Verse 16. This is, this is interesting, folks. Hang on to this. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. How can you be healed? Confess your sin to each other and pray for one another. Isn't that interesting that 
in a big service like normally we do on Sunday, this is not possible. What he's saying is that healing is not in crusades. Healing is in care groups. <laughs> I mean, do you want to confess your sin in front of the whole church? I didn't think so. You probably would. If your care group is real, <laughs> if your care group is what it's supposed to be, that means relationship has been built. Not just relationship where to eat, where to go, what movie to watch. No, no, no. I'm talking about a real brother and sister in Christ relationship where we are we have this relationship with a purpose not just to kill time but I have the, this relationship with the purpose of encouraging one another helping each other to walk the walk of a Christian and and exhorting one another with the word of God reminding each other of the goodness of the Lord that's what care group is supposed to be doing if that's established, then I can see in a, in a gathering of six, seven, maybe even eight people, you can say, look, guys, I messed up. I did this, I did that. Confessing your sins to one another. And then you pray for one another. And when you pray for one another, it says, you will experience healing. Isn't that interesting? I think God put a stop on the Sunday service as we know it to give an opportunity for this real thing to start flourishing all over. Amen. Real discipleship, real relationship, real brother and sister in Christ thing here. Wow, this is beautiful. So, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Don't be anxious, church. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. In Christ Jesus. As we close here, you know, back to that those plagues that we talk about, you know. It's interesting, the ninth plague, the last one before the the most horrible one when firstborns were killed. It's the last one. It's so appropriate because we're so close to Easter now. In Exodus chapter 10, verse 21, a darkness descend upon the land of Egypt. A tangible darkness. Now the translation says, a darkness that can be felt. Wow. And when I read that, I thought, isn't that so fitting for today? A darkness has descended upon the land. A darkness that can be felt. It says people could not see one another. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that just what's going on right now? We're not supposed to gather. But here's what verse 23 says. But all the Israelites had light in their dwelling. Isn't that amazing? There's darkness that is felt across the nations right now. But in Goshen, there is light. There is light. You are light in the darkness. You are. You can guide people to Goshen right now. People need hope. And, the, and hope is not a word only. It's a person. Hope is a person. His name is Jesus. So all of us that have Jesus in our lives, we are the light in the middle of the darkness. So with that, would you just stand with me together and declare, Hallelujah. We're no longer slaves of fear. 
I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. Come on, say it. I'm no longer. our place. This is who we are. We thank you for making us your child. Hallelujah. I want to pray for you and I want to ask Pastor Steffi to come and we just want to pray a special prayer of blessing as the shepherds that God, where's John? As the shepherds that God has placed in this house, I want us to just stand in unity. Come, come here, John. Let's, the three of us, let's just extend our hands and we pray for the blessing of God to be upon the people of God right now. I believe that there is a special protection for you. There is a special blessing for you. And you don't have to be afraid. You can just ask. You can pray with confidence. Knowing his purpose. Knowing your place. Knowing the right posture. Amen. So right now, all of you, stand up, extend your hand, and receive in faith these prayers of blessings from your shepherds right now. It's not because we're special. God put us here for his purpose and and, and we are going to be praying for you in unity. Starting with Pastor Steffi right here. Go ahead. Church, know that no weapon formed against you shall prevail. Because God is for you, not against you. That He loved you so much that He gave His one and only Son. That it was out of His mercy and kindness, He leads you to repentance so you are going to be the head and not the tail you will be above and not beneath you are to increase and not to decrease you shall be protected all the plagues and the sickness that were uh, put upon the egyptians they're not going to come close to you because the lord your god is the mighty warrior he is mighty to save he's mighty to deliver so believe it receive it by faith that you are to be shielded to be protected you are to be spared from the plagues and the sickness that came upon the children of the Egyptians. But you are the children 
of the living God. So receive it in Jesus' name. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much for your goodness and faithfulness in our lives. Lord, I want to pray for all of my brothers and sisters who are joining and who are part of our family. Lord, I just want to pray that in this time that you would just ignite their faith, God. I pray that you would help them to just realize how dependent they are upon you. Lord, use this situation, God, to, um, to make us more dependent upon you. And I pray, Father, that uh, your church would shine during this time, that, Lord, your church would shine as being a kind, generous, sacrificial people, Lord. I pray that we would not be uh, a people that looks only to our needs, but may we look to the needs of others, God, in this time. Father, we know that your church shines brightest in times of darkness and trial, and may that be true of us, Lord. May we not be overcome by fear, but may we overcome by faith through your Son, Jesus, and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, may we be a light in our homes, in our families, to our neighbors, to our brothers and sisters. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of Jesus, I pray for this prayer of blessing upon our congregation. Lord, let them be a blessing this week. I believe thousands of people will receive phone calls from our congregation right here. A prayer of blessing, a prayer of healing, a prayer of concern, a prayer of caring. And your word will be spread. Oh Lord, they will not just be uh, laying down and just being quarantine at home with nothing they're going to pick up the phone and scour their address books oh lord and call people and care for people and speak blessings upon people use each and every one of them as they are blessed let them be a blessing right now that all nations will be blessed through them in the name of jesus now folks receive these blessings from the lord for the lord bless you and keep you and the lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. Receive these blessings in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And everybody says, Amen. God bless you. Be fruitful this week. Hallelujah. See you next week.